Um, all right, so good evening and a warm welcome to uh, AOS members and our guests worldwide. I'm Sarah Cabrese from the Anglo Marni Society, and I'm joined by two distinguished panelists today, Janet Watson and Ali Al Mahri. They'll be discussing beauty and diversity, language, culture, and nature in Southern Arabia. Um, first, our panelists will give a 40 minute presentation and then we'll take some questions. So the webinar will be about an hour long. Please send your questions via the Zoom's Q&A function and uh, we'll aim to reply to as many of them as we can in the time we've got. Uh, we're recording the session and a video of it will be available on the anglo Marni Society website under the webinars page where you can also find some of our last webinars that we've done. Um, so a little bit about speakers. Janet Watson is joining us from Leeds. Janet is co-director of the Center for Endangered Languages, Cultures and Ecosystems at the University of Leeds. Her main research interests lie in the documentation of modern South Arabian languages and Yemeni Arabic dialects, with a particular focus on theoretical, phonological and morphological approaches to language varieties spoken within the Southwestern Arabian Peninsula. Since the 23rd of March this year, she has been hosting online workshops on language and nature in Southern Arabia through Zoom. Ali Al Mahri is joining us from Salala and is a bilingual speaker of two modern South Arabian languages, Mahri and Shehret. He has been collaborating on research on modern South Arabian languages and on the language nature nexus since December 2009. He has co-presented with Janet Watson at 10 international conferences and workshops, co-taught four language courses and has co-presented six guest lectures at international venues. He has also co-authored two academic articles and has co-authored two books on the languages of Dafar. I know that Janet and Ali have a lot of really interesting and illuminating things to talk to you about today. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Janet. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Sarika. Thank you everyone for, for attending this talk. I'm delighted to be giving this talk with my friend and colleague, Ali Al-Mahri. Um, I came up with this title a few weeks ago, Beauty and Diversity, Language and Nature in Southern Arabia. And I remember a few, a few years ago, the UK research councils came up with a theme of beauty. And I thought at the time, what's the point in having a theme like beauty? And then in recent weeks, I've been thinking, what, it, what is beauty? How can we judge beauty? What makes a picture beauty, beautiful? What makes a society beautiful? And I thought that a lot of it is in the diversity. So if we look at this picture, you'll probably think that this is a beautiful picture, but what is beautiful about it? And you probably won't pick out one single thing, because if I just showed you that one single thing, you may well not consider it to be beautiful. So our thesis today is that beauty lies in natural diversity across local language, culture and nature. So that beauty is not just intangible things that can be viewed, but also in the intangible. We're going to talk about the far very briefly, about the topography, then look at the language varieties of the far, look at linguistic endangerment factors, consider biodiversity in the region. We examine cultural and linguistic richness because beauty I take, I take it as being in language as being, as being part of richness. And then look at language and nature and how species, language, culture and nature. We look at species and languages, colors, space and measure, and nature and met metaphor. And then at the end, we want to talk about a few aspects of language documentation and revitalization. And if time permits, I'll keep an eye on the time. If time permits, I would like to present to you um, one of our children's ebooks, which was completed yesterday about Salem and his shadow. Again, if you look at this picture, I consider this picture beautiful. And when I ask myself, what is it that is beautiful about it? It's the shadows, it's the colours, it's the shapes, it's the smooth lines and the rough lines. When Ali al Mehri speaks, then I will, I will say to him, 
he will speak in Mehri. So if we look at the relationship between language, culture and nature, indigenous languages reflect the close relationship between people and their natural environment. And I was just talking to Sarika before we started. Very few people know that there are 13 indigenous languages in the UK. We think of ourselves as a monoglot little island, but we're not. Inhabited regions of the world which exhibit greatest biodiversity also exhibit greatest linguistic diversity and that's a really interesting puzzle so if we look at if we look at central america for example that's a real hotbed for for biocultural di biocultural diversity so biodiversity and cultural diversity and this is an interesting fact that since since 1970 there's been a 30 a 30 percent loss in biodiversity and recent studies show that the loss in linguistic diversity tracks and exceeds, in certain cases, loss in biodiversity. This state is, yeah, a real watershed. We see that endangered languages and cultures cluster in the same region as endangered species, and we'll take a few examples from that. And not only do languages reflect nature, they can also be used to help revitalize ecosystems. So it's linguistic knowledge which is used to revive endangered species. And in terms of Oman, we see that in the Arabian oryx and the Arabian leopard. So the far, as many of you know, is very varied topographically. We've got the coast, we've got the Garbib, the coastal plain, we have the foothills rising to the garden, the central, the central plateau, falling towards the, uh, the Seh, the, uh, the gravel desert, and then on to the sand desert. And here are a few pictures. So we've got the coast. Again, where does the beauty lie? You can't pick out one single thing here. And then the foothills and the Jabba, the central plateau. This is taken during the, the monsoon period. The gravel desert and the Negd. And it's this topographical diversity which leads to diversity in terms of ecosystems, but also I'd maintain diversity in terms of languages. If we look now at the language varieties of the FAR, and you might wonder why I'm calling and describing these language varieties as language varieties rather than languages, there is a lot of politics in the term language and the term dialect. Many people may think that if, if they can understand another language, that it's a dialect of their own. So, for example, when I worked in Norway, my head of department was from Denmark. I learned Norwegian. Um, she gave a talk about nine months after I started. And I asked her how long it had taken her to learn to speak in Norwegian. And she told me she never spoke Norwegian. I understood it, but it was a different language. So it's very difficult to talk about language and dialect. So according to UNESCO Atlas of the World's Languages in Danger, there are eight languages listed for Amman. And within the FAR, we're talking about Mehri, which is described as definitely endangered, Saharat, severely endangered, but Hari, critically endangered, we would say moribund. So in, this, in the Atlas of the World's Languages in Danger, they say there are about 400 speakers of Bhattari. Well, we know that that is, that is a, a, a real gross overestimation. There are probably around, around 15, 12, 15 speakers. Hubiot is severely endangered. And I put an asterisk by Hubiot because Hubiot, by many Mehri and Saharat speakers, is considered to be a dialect of one of those languages. But Hubiot speakers consider it to be a language. And then we've got Beit Khir, which isn't indigenous, it isn't endemic to, um, to the far, um, originally came from Hyderabad, but there's a big presence of, of, 
Vic there, which is called Tlanayit in Mehri. Um, and it's a really very unusual dialect of Arabic, if it's a dialect of Arabic. We're going to be talking, when we talk about the languages, we're going to be talking about Mehri and Saharat. So this is, this is a map of the uh, distribution of the languages. The map should come right up here into Saudi Arabia, but didn't for reasons best known to ourselves. Um, we see that, can you see the arrow, Sarika? Yeah. So we see that Mehri is, is spoken of the widest portion of, uh, of the region. Uh, Harsusi is here but way outside the, the, far, uh, the far region. Shaharat is spoken in the mountains and on the coast along here. Got Badhari here. Uh, Shaharat's also spoken on the Halaniat Islands and Hubiut across the border. And then we've got, we've got Socotri here, and we will be talking a little bit about Socotri. So the region that we're really focusing on is, is here, what you see in this map. In previous talks, we've suggested numbers of speakers for the different languages, and I don't dare do that anymore. It's impossible to know. As we've seen, Mehri is spoken over three state borders. There are also communities in the Gulf and in uh, East Africa. It's impossible to say how many speakers there are. And the other thing is, what does it mean to be a speaker? Does it mean that you can just get by, or does it mean that you've got considerable knowledge of, of particular semantic fields? So we're not going to go there. So we're going to talk about language endangerment factors. I've got these written up in... Uh, in English so that you can read them where Ali is going to talk about these now. Okay. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Mashkura al Dr. Janet Shkurma Nikwa al Hatarin Gimi and Ula Satida. Uh Ragmi Awal Mara Akun Al Beth Mubah Ratkun Takni Binis Bali Shuya Yani. Awal Mara Ilan in Shallah bin Hawal Mufi Balakarab. بالنسبة للتهديدات اللقوية بالنسبة للقة المهرية والشحرية حقيقة تهديدات قد تكون كبيرة الناس كانوا في الماضي عايشين في الريف وفي البادية مشغولين مع حيواناتهم واللقة ما في أي لقة دخيلة عليهم غير اللقة المحلية اللي يتحدثوا فيها ما بينتهم البيت اليوم بالنسبة للجيل الجديد أصبحت مع المدارس موجودة تأثير باللغة العربية المدارس بالعربية طبعا لا توجد حتى الآن كتابة للمهرية أو الشحرية أو من هذه أي واحدة من هذه اللغات الدراسة طبعا بالعربي بالإضافة إلى أن اللي على كالتلفزيون وغيره وأنت وكلها بالعربي لا توجد هناك كتابة أو مرجعية لهذه اللغات غير نطق فيها فقط والتهديدات كثيرة ومن ثم التهديدات حتى اليوم التليفون ما نقدر نسجل رسالة بالمهرية نسجل رسالة طبعا إذا كانت بالمهرية بس كل الحروف مش موجودة تكون ناقصة الحروف المفروض تطيف إلى كود التليفون وغيره والتهديدات حقيقة كثير من الأجيال الحالية نقصت عندهم اللغة وضعفت أكثر من أربعين في المئة قد لا أكون بلغت في بعض الأحيان قد تكون أكثر من أربعين بالمئة في المصطلحات بالإضافة الهجرة الهجرة من الريف والبادية إلى المناطق الحضرية في المدينة هذا له تأثير كبير لما الناس يروحوا طبعا ما يكونوا ساكنين سكنتهم مثل لو المواشي بدو متنقلين لا الآن أصبحت العبارات هذه ما تستخدم كثير منها فللأسف يعني نتمنى يعني أن تكون هناك والآن إن شاء الله في نحن في خط هذا السير وفي هذا الاتجاه قد كتبنا بعض الكتب بالتعاون مع جامعات في لندن 
وشكر الاستاذة جنت هي طبعا اول معانا من دخلنا في هذا الاتجاه في المحافظة على اللغات الموجودة في جنوب عمان والاهتمام فيها شيء أيه. نت So there's been a huge amount of change since the 1970s and probably the biggest thing is urbanization. So people going from nomadic or a nomadic existence or rural existence where they're dealing with their with the livestock to living in living in the city. Um, and one of the things we see with that is um, Things like, for example, um, shade and shelter. Shade and shelter was such important aspects of the culture. You had to have someone who could help you provide shade and shelter. Certain trees are valued because of the shade that they allow. Now, with people inside houses, they don't need that. So let's go on. Um, in terms of biodiversity, The Far and Al Mahra are distinguished by receiving the monsoon rains from June through to September, giving four very distinct seasons. So we've got the monsoon period, followed by Zaira, which is often described as spring, followed by winter, which is the only season which coincides with our seasons, with the seasons in, in, in the north followed in, almost immediately by the hot period. So it can go from very cold within a few days to, to very hot. There are 78 flora species that are endemic to Oman out of a total of 12, uh, 1240, of which the FAR has got 57 of them. And the FAR is a, this, a smaller part of Oman. Thanks to Shahina for that, Shahina Khatanfar for that information. Socotra, It's the fourth most biodiverse island on the planet. All of its land mollusks, 90% of, of its reptile species and 33% of its plant species are found nowhere else on the planet. Only six of the 181 bird species are endemic. And I learnt on Tuesday there were 11 different types of frankincense trees. And one of the things that the whole region is... Um, is, is threatened by, at the moment, I just got this piece of news through The Guardian earlier today, is oil spills. And there's a huge oil spill off the data, which may well, which will damage, which greatly damage the sea, uh, not only in the Red Sea, but also further south. I said earlier that endangered, langu endangered languages cluster in the same region as endangered species. And so here we've got the Arabian leopard, which is critically endangered. And you can see on this map where it was historically, where it is confirmed, and where it is possible. Um, and that's the, the leopard is critically endangered and Shaharet is severely endangered. In terms of smooth black, black tip shark, this is endangered. These slides are thanks to Alec Moore. And Mehri is definitely endangered, endangered and it's clustering in the same area. Right, when we look at linguistic and cultural richness, there are a number of reasons why we think that these languages are possibly the oldest extant Semitic language family. One is that they have three plain sibilants one of which is lateral. And we know from ancient South Arabian that there were three plain sibilants. We don't know how the third sibilant or how any of the sibilants were, were pronounced, but we suspect that one of them was a lateral. The other reason is that um, this is the only extant Semitic language family that has dual pronouns for all persons both in the independent pronouns and in the verb. We know that standard Arabic, classical Arabic, has got, uh, has got uh, dual pronouns, but there is no Arabic dialect that uses, that uses the pronouns, it uses um, dual pronouns. What's interesting about 
modern South Arabian is that they have dual pronouns not only for you and they, but also for me and one other. And we only find that in Ugaritic, in other language fam in other uh, Semitic languages. When we look at the number of consonantal sounds that there are in, in Mehri and Seheret, we see there are a substantial number more than there are in Arabic. I'm not going to go through them. You've got the Arabic list on the right, the Mehri one on the left, and to the far left, Seheret. So we've got, in, here we have examples of different types of sounds. The Shat, Kliaft, Tamarit, Dart, Chanaith, Chanaith, Admit, Kaip, Kaip, and Kbalit. We get lexical richness in many aspects of the, of the culture. So milk is extremely important. When I first went to the Far, I said, I'd really like to go to a Thafari restaurant and eat typical Thafari food. And slightly tongue in cheek, I was told, if you do that, you'll drink milk. If someone didn't come with milk in the evening, you'd just go, go hungry. And so you have, these are just a selection of some of the terms that you have for milk. I'm not going to go through them, but you have things like oh, white milk after the end of the beastings, our loom turned off milk, where in English you've got to have a phrase in order to be able to translate it. Milk for us is important too, but it doesn't have anything like the importance it does in the far. Um, in, among the Mehra and Balich uh, Hek, men are, are, taught to, are taught their lineage to be able to recite their lineage. So that's quite, quite normal for, for a young boy to be able to recite his lineage. I do know quite young, quite young men who can recite not only their lineage, but also the lineages of tens of other people, which I think is absolutely extraordinary. And this is it's a feature of Bedouin society. But what is interesting in this society is that men are known by a matronymic. So um, you'd have your name, Bern, son of, plus the mother's name. So Ali could be Ali Barukhiak after his mother. The women are known by a patronymic. So I'm Janet, Bert, Peter. Peter is my, my dad's name. And families and individuals are often known after, after a female ancestor. So Saeed and Ali's family are known as Bitber and Gema. And Gema was the mother of, of, their, of their father, their grandmother. Bitber Oye, Bitber Baroque, women's names. Women played, played and play a very important role in society. We look at the relationship between language, culture and nature now. We've got the basic division of the colour palette. There are four basic colours. And four languages that are so rich culture, uh, so rich lexically. It's interesting that there are just these four basic colours. But these are all from nature. So Ova is going to be is going to be to do with the soil, blood. Hoa is lack of colour, black as night. Ubon is to do with light. And everything else is called hatop. There are quite a few languages where you get gru, green and blue have the same term, but this is grolo. So everything in that picture would be described as hatop. Basically, I think a child refers to something that lives, living things. And all the colours there, apart from the writing um, and uh, the main greyish thing in the middle, would be, would be a child. Once we come to livestock colours, though, alongside the basic colours, you have a plethora of additional colours. And I've given you a sample here. So for the camel, our fruit bay 
has made black. Ubenit has sarit, we've already seen this. Sanhmeh, Malacht, Judeit, Sahuih, Hukak, and Sahmeh. And then for goats, depends on the depends on the animal as to what term you're going to use. Terkat. So that's a lovely little terkat goat. Tabrik, piebald, abdir, splodged. They often describe this as he's he's a jacket of geishi, like like um, combat, like a combat jacket. Me pointed like a cat. Habsit, grey. And names uh, of types of of types of uh, camel, for example, and reins are related to to nature. The stars are related. The reins are related to the stars. So, on the ascendance of these particular stars, when the rain falls, they know that if rain falls when on the ascendance of the Hamer star, it's going to be it's going to be really strong rain. And there have been several floods and uh, cyclones connected with Hamamit and Hamer, and less so with Dorfa. So directions, time and measure. And what's interesting here is that directions are topographical. We don't talk about north and south. We talk about the direction in which the floodwaters flow. Umka is the direction in which the floodwaters flow. And Alhak is where they have come from. Or the sea or the mountains or the desert. So where are you going? Going to going negd towards the neg, towards your negd, or umsa or alhak. And they've got this lovely saying. We would say he doesn't know well in English we'd say he doesn't know his ass from his elbow, it's a bit rude. <laughs> um, but in, in Mehri you'd say Fulani Khurub al Hak min umsala. So and so doesn't know downstream, upstream from downstream. Um, and unfortunately, we're now in the situation where the younger generation really doesn't know upstream from downstream. So it's a way of saying someone knows nothing. And time through naming. So even now, if I want to make an appointment with someone, I won't necessarily say I'll meet you at four o'clock. Or, or two o'clock, I will use terms such as kalaini, kalaani, subihan. And we have we have twenty four twenty four terms here for the different times of day, and Ali will read will pronounce these now. Good to start. Okay. For the next few days, the people who didn't have hours or, I mean, something you know about the time. I mean, I'm, for example, going to bed at noon. Noon. The hour is like that. The hour is like that. I'm going to say nine, nine and a half. For the next few days, they were choosing the time. I mean. تقريبا على 24 ساعة وكل ساعة لها مسمى مثلا الصباح مع صلاة الفجر كفيجر كفيجر فهج بعدها هجي فهج ذا حيوم فهج ذا حيوم آه شروق أوتن يعني مع الشروق البسيط الضوء كسرك 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 يعني مع الشروق كسرك بعد سرك بعد الشروق صوابيحا كسوبح ذوبا آه ذواليبا ذوبا نهورا نهورا يعني مع توسط النهار في كبد السماء يعني الظهر تقريبا نهورا آه كزو كزو لما تزيل آه الشمس الى اتجاه ما بعد ما بعد الظهر زوال كزو كالعصر آه قسارون قسارين كلايني كلاني كم جوزة كجزاء كجزاء مع القروب كبزاء بعد بعد جزاء حاول ضاصر بحلي بدي ضاصر فك هذا ضاصر تولي ضاصر هذا تقريبا أربعة أربعة وعشرين كلمة على التوقيت الأربعة وعشرين ساعة أربعة وعشرين فادي سامك وهتسلي And then measure is also done through naming in terms of herd sizes. You're not supposed to count goats. So there was a time when I was up in the mountains 
with Alan's aunt and his younger brother started to count very noisily, very loudly, the goats. And she said she hit him with a stick. She said, don't do that. So we've got underrated hatar. Underrated is enough goats or cows or camels to give a small amount of milk. Hatar is a very small herd of goats, cows or camels that you would have close to you from Habar. It's henukt. And then I've given the dry measures there. So we've got livestock herd sizes and uh, dry measures. Yeah. And then um, nature comes into metaphor. We know nature comes into metaphor. It does very much so with it, it, in Britain, but perhaps to a lesser extent. Um, I photographed this about 2013 on a trip to the uh, to the Badia with Said, um, and I was told this this tree is called Seamer. Uh, and if you would describe someone as Seema, it means that they, they are tall and thin and they've got a shock of hair. But Ba'al Seema also means uh, like the devil. Hala, shaitan. A gin, ginni. Yeah. They can mean the jinn. So if I talk about Seema, then someone might say, Oh, the Billah, the shaitan. Araji. Min Ba'al Seema. And then um, this is not the right. This should not be uh, the picture that I show you. I should have managed to get one from from the far, but I'm afraid I haven't. I got this from Sharga. Tracking in the sand desert uh, and in the gravel desert is extremely important. It, it was a matter of life and death. Shlev means trace. And we've got grammaticalization by which one word which has a concrete meaning takes on a less concrete meaning. So trust, trace uh, is, is grammaticalized to a particle, which means it turns out to be. And we have an example like this. I saw a camel, I thought it was mine, but, but from its tracks, it turned out to be your camel. And it makes sense, because if I put my thumbprint there, if I put my fingerprint there, that is unique to me. So the track of something is unique to it. It turns out to be, it's from its track. Sarika, do we have, can we have a couple more minutes, a few more? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, so this is an example this example, which uh, uh, Ali will read out, is I found I found the track. I found a track on the sand, and I thought it was a man's track, but it turned out to be a woman's track. Kisk chef, arramlat. Bekoch chef the rik. Be chefesh er chef And then the same thing in Mahrayit. Chef arramlat. Wa kabeh chef the rik. Wa chefeh. Um, so one of the things that we've been thinking about over the past decade is about revitalization of languages, cultures and, and local ecosystems and how that could possibly be done. And what, what we have done is, as much as possible, um, talks that I have given since 2014 have almost invariably been done with one or more native speakers. Um, since 23rd of March, as Sarika mentioned at the beginning, I've been running online workshops with academics, professionals and community members. And I make sure that every one of those workshops, with a couple of exceptions, has at least one talk by a community member. And then, of course, we've got the role of YouTube and digital media and the Mahra and uh, modern South Arabian speakers are brilliant at using YouTube and, uh, and putting, up, uh, putting up information. And then we've been developing the children's literature around nature. I suppose we probably won't have time to show this little story that I've done, but uh, I, can, I can send information about it. We finished a story about yeah, just yesterday about a little boy called Salem and his shadow, uh, which draws on the importance of shade and shelter in the culture. 
which also comes into into the use of metaphor. If someone's very forgetful, people would say, he's so forgetful, he'll forget his shadow. And this is about a little boy who does indeed forget his shadow and lose his shadow and has to go and look for it. Um, yeah. So to sum up, beauty for me lies in diversity across natural, local languages, cultures and ecosystems, and they can all be brought into imbalance by emigration, immigration. You take the language out of the ecosystem, out of the culture, then it starts to, it starts to dissipate. Um, and these are threatened by incredibly remarkable social and environmental change over an incredibly short period. So you're going from tribal and self-reliance to government reliance. Everyone, they had this incredible tight system where they worked out who was going to fetch water, who was going to fetch, who was going to, to, to fetch fruit, who was going to deal with the livestock, milk. And now no one goes to fetch water. Water comes out of the wall. And we've had this break in the human nature relationship. So the idea of the importance of Hula Wagona, shade and shelter is no longer important because we've got roofs. But I maintain that humans aren't designed to be in within four walls and a roof. They should be outside. We've got this loss of expertise because the young people are no longer working with their with their with their fathers or their mothers with livestock, no longer producing water skins or milk bowls. And we've got loss of the environment and loss of species. And then the importation of new materials. And we saw when we were looking at, at measure and time that there are names for different times of the day and there are names for different measures. And that's being replaced by kilo and numbers. If we have a couple more minutes, <laughs> okay, yeah. So Ali's got a very a very short story about someone who worked um he was in the army, a Brit a, a Brit in the army in the far. And he learnt Mahi and Shahrat. Yeah, and he says it's going to be less than half a minute. Let's see. <laughs> Don't say uh -huh. uh, بالنسبة للمهرية والشحرية صعبة لغير المتحدثين فيها أن يفهموها سواء يتكلموا عربي أو أي لغة أخرى فصعبة جدا في البداية بس أنا أذكر لما كنت صغير كان بريطانية موجودين عندنا في الريف في الجبل وكانوا مع الفرق الوطنية فأنا أذكر شخص بريطاني اسمه كينيدي أنا كنت صغير حقيقة العمر لا يتجاوز ستة وسبعة سنوات كان هذا الشخص كندي يتحدث بالمهرية بحكم أنه مشرف في قوات الفرق الوطنية ودائما يحتك بالأفراد وشارك معهم في الحروب ضد الثورة الشعية طبعا كان هذا كندي من كثرة الاحتكاك مع أصحابه صار يفهم ويتكلم مهرية وكذلك الشحرية هذا الشخص أذكر أتمنى لو كان حي أني ألاقي هذا الشخص أني كنت في مرحلة سن صغير وكان هذا الشخص بالنسبة لي يعني قريبة إنه يتكلم من اللغات ويجيدها وهو مقير سكان المنطقة بس رقم منها صعبة المهرية والشحرية في شخص كذلك بريطاني آخر بس هذا تقريبا في الأربعينات في منطقة البادية بادية المهرة في أتوقع في اليمن فجاء إلى المهرة وجلس عندهم تقريبا سنتين ثلاث سنوات ولما رجع أريد يفهم اللغة يفهم المهرية لما رجع قالوا إيش فهمت من لقى المهرية ومن المهرة جاب قوطي بيبسي حط في ثلاثة أربعة حجارات وطلب بالبيبسي قالوا إيش فهمتوا 
قالوا ايش فهمنا ما فهمنا حقاره في القوطي قال انا نفس الشيء ما فهمنا شيء بس حقاره وصوت فصعبه جدا المهريه والشعريه I'm very, I'm very sad. So I'm going to just, I'm just going to give a really brief summary of that. There was a guy called Kennedy who he met when he was about six or seven and he was high up in the army and he'd really love to meet him if he was, if he was still alive. He may well not be. And he spoke Mehri and um, Shaharat. Uh, and there was someone else who was also there Um, and, and he was asked, do you understand Mehri? And he took a can of Pepsi and put some stones in it and shook the can. And he said, do you understand that? And people said, no. And he said, that's what I'm like with Mehri. <laughs> so we will, we will finish on that, on that note. We'd like to thank, of course, the Anglo Mani Society, the League Hume Trust, the AHRC. Endangered Languages Documentation Pro Project, Saeed Al-Mahri, Miranda Morris, Fabio Gasparini, Alec Moore, Andrew Spalton, Shahina Qazamfar, and Ahmed Harrasi. Abel Yassamkum. Thank you. Thank sense. you very much, Janet sense. and Ali, um, for such an enlightening lecture. Um, I'll now turn to some of the questions that we got through. And Brilliant. if anyone has any further questions, please keep posting them in the Q&A section. Brilliant. Um, is it all right with you, Janet, if I give uh, people your email address um, if they want to get in touch about uh, questions or about your sto short story? Cool. Or you've lost yes. the shadow. Yeah. Um, okay, so... First question then, um, are there schools that are teaching Mahri and Shehret um, and what other initiatives are there in place to protect Oman's endangered languages? Um, so there aren't any, no, there aren't any, there aren't any schools at the moment. I hope, I hope in the future we will do a meeting. ويسمح لنا نعمل معهد باللغه العربيه المهريه والشحريه حتى yeah. الان لا يوجد حتى الان لا يوجد للاسف yeah unfortunately there isn't anything at the moment what Ali would really like to do is uh, set up an institute to teach mehri and shahrat so at the moment they're just relying on people parents passing it down to their children parents passing it down to their children yeah عاطمة عاطمة في الثمانينات القرن الماضي وفي السبعينات والثمانينات كان في التلفزيون العماني برنامج الريفي البرنامج الريفي يذاع في الاسبوع حلقه واحده يوم الثلاثاء فكانت لابد بالمهريه والشحريه بس <تصفيق> الان للاسف الان للاسف ما يوجد اي حاجه عن المهريه والشحريه Yeah, there used to be in the 1970s, 1980s, there used to be a television program called the Burnama Jarifi, the country program. And it would broadcast mainly in uh, Saharat, but also in Mehri and Hubiu sometimes. Okay. Uh, but unfortunately, that, that stopped. Mm, okay. Yeah. Mm. Uh, okay, so could you please touch base again on the relationship between endangered languages and endangered species? Uh, why do you think that it is that rare languages and rare species of plants and animals exist in the same regions, if you think that's the reason? That's from Fatah. Okay. okay. Um, the amount of, well, I suppose the amount of, if you've got, if you've got a great deal of diversity in terms of the natural world, then you don't have to move very far to get your resources. Mm -hmm. What that means is that you can have small, you can have communities living in a much smaller area. Yeah? Mm -hmm. If you've got communities living in smaller areas, lots of smaller areas, then you're going to get different languages developing. So we see that very much in, in the Americas, in Southern, in, in Southern America. So Mexico, for example, Central America and Southern America. You don't have to move far. Therefore, the, the community isn't spreading out as far as the community spreads, spreads out very far, then you're going to get one language over a much larger area. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. Um, I suppose there's also something in um, places which have endangered species and animals and languages aren't given as much attention as places that have like wider... Yeah. You know, and protected ones so on kind of yes things. yes exactly so you're, you're unlikely to get an endangered species in london yeah <laughs> <laughs> um okay another question this one's from francis um does the island of socotra belong to oman if so are there omani authority are the omani authorities encouraging ecological tourism 
Hmm. No, it doesn't. It belongs to Yemen. Ah. Although it's nearer to it's nearer to East Africa than it is to Yemen, but it's part of Yemen. And there are big problems in Socotra at the moment, with the UAE planning to uh, planning to build big hotels. And as far as I can see, they're not looking for sustainable tourism. Right. They're looking for nice beaches. And it, Socotra is in. It's 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 threatened, and it's such it's it's so awful because it's such a such an amazing archipelago. Hmm. Um, and I'll take um, someone suggesting a Mehri and Shahret poetry competition broadcast on Omani TV. Yeah, well, that would be a great idea. Yeah, مسابقة مسابقة شعرية on the television, yeah, great. Mm. Um, he said that Abu Dhabi TV began a very popular Shara Million program. And absolutely, absolutely. Red line yeah. and, po and poetry is so important. I don't know. I don't know a single household in the far where they don't have a poet. Mm. I mean, we think if 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 you if you would say, oh my my father is a poet here in Britain, that would be something really amazing, wouldn't it? But, yeah. <laughs> but it's just every day and. In the fire yeah. and, in, and in Yemen, of course. And um, someone's also asked about the script used, uh, whether it's developed for Mahri um, and is it being used by native speakers? Um, yes, uh, the script was developed, the particular script that we use was developed in 2013, um, but different different communities use different types of script. So the Mehri Center for Studies and Research in Al-Baida came up with a script, which um, I believe uses, it's too complicated to be used. The idea behind the script that we developed was that there should be a minimal number of additional mm. characters to, to encourage people to use it. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Is it working? Uh, sort of, yeah. Mm. But, very often what you do is, you know, like, if I, if I said to you, how do you pronounce G-H in English? Yeah. Yeah? I mean, yeah? The English script is very impoverished. You don't know how to pronounce G-H until you know yeah. what the word is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, using phones, we tend to just use the, the characters that, that we have for Arabic, and you know from the context. And we also have a question from Ruth, who's, uh, it's a question for Ali. Uh, how do the younger generations of Mehri view themselves as Mehri or as Arab or Omani? And how does that influence the language? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, كاتد فنوه النكاح ذي من عمان عموني ويسن محن فيهم ويسن محن بي ويسن فيهم كاتد لك بيرته أي مهري مهري بعض حير بعض حير يعتز بكبيلة بال بالوطن كدولة وطبعا بالعصر يمر من هاري يسن محن فيهم اليوم كل yeah they see themselves as everything all of those but there's a really a really strong link with the tribe okay yeah nice okay i'll take two more questions um so first one from i think myra um are speakers of these endangered languages usually bilingual with arabic they are now yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. but they didn't used to be they didn't used to be bilingual in arabic but multilingualism was the norm okay because people would come down from the mountains, people who spoke people who spoke uh, come down from the mountains, and they would communicate in their language with people who spoke Arabic mm -hmm. on the coast, yeah, okay. and understand each other perfectly. And you still get that, okay, where, where someone will speak Mahri and someone else will respond in Shaharat, and they understand each other perfectly. Okay. But the verb, the verb that's used for to understand a language, you would only say a uh, I can or I understand a language if I if you can speak it. Mm -hmm. So I know people who can understand Shaharat perfectly, and they they'll just say a call the Shaharat lot. Okay, can't speak it. Like with the Norway example you gave earlier. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, okay, and then the final question. Um, do you think that the language, vocabulary and grammatical structures available to us um, in, in whatever language we speak shape how we perceive the world around us? Yeah, I think they do. And I think, I think that they are also influenced by, by the world around us too. Uh, so one of the reasons that I think, for example, that the dual has persisted so much is that traditionally you would always have your friend with you. Ah, yeah. that makes perfect sense, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much. I'm afraid we're coming to the end of the hour, so we'll have to wrap up. Um, and sorry to anyone whose questions haven't been answered, but um, hopefully we got to most of them. And if you have further questions, I can just drop the Anglo Marnie Society an email and I'll forward them on to Janet. Um, but thank you to both Janet and Ali um, very much on behalf of the Anglo Marnie Society and all of our attendees uh, for delivering such a valuable and enriching lecture. Um, and thank you also to Dina and Nick who have helped organise everything behind the scenes and to our audience for attending. I hope you've all enjoyed it and we hope that you will um, come join us again soon for another webinar in the series.